Last Sunday morning, as you know, the Lord led me to go back to a passage that we last looked at four years ago, 1 Corinthians 12. And it's quite obvious that there was a profound reason why he led in that way. And in the same way, he has led this Sunday that we should go on with that same passage and read together and study together 1 Corinthians 13. It is far more relevant now than it was even four years ago, or than it was about four years before that. For I remember preaching to you on this chapter one night about six months before I came here. And this chapter we go back to again and again. It's as if God wants us to be reminded that love is still the most important thing of all. So let's read 1 Corinthians 13, but I'm going to start reading at verse 31 of chapter 12, and I'm going to finish reading at verse 1 of chapter 14. It was men who put the chapter headings in, and it has spoiled the word of God. So let's get over that little problem by linking it with the previous and the subsequent chapter but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. But now we see but a poor reflection. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Let me read you something that I came across recently by someone called Emmett Fox. There is no difficulty that enough love will not conquer. There is no injury that enough love will not heal. There is no door that enough love cannot open. There is no gulf that enough love will not bridge. There is no wall that enough love will not throw down. There is no sin that enough love will not redeem. It makes no difference how deeply seated may be the trouble, how hopeless the outlook, how muddled the tinkle, how great the mistake. A sufficient realization of love would dissolve it all. If only you could love enough, you would be the happiest and most powerful being in the world. I don't know who Emmett Fox was, but those words have captured something of 1 Corinthians 13. You can't talk about love without getting poetical. 
three quarters of the pop songs are still about love. And indeed, 1 Corinthians 13 is a poem, even in the English, the beauty of the language comes across, especially in the authorized version where the old Elizabethan language lent itself so readily to music of the tongue. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. You, you get the flow of the language and the words. But there is always a danger in poetry, and that is that you get the beauty of the language and miss the meaning. And there is much poetry being written today that is meaningless. It sounds wonderful until you ask, what did it say? And then you realize your mind is a blank. And the beauty of the language has disguised from you the cutting edge of the message, if there is a message. Now in 1 Corinthians 13, the beauty of the language can be such that we put it in a glass case and we, we enshrine it in Sunday worship. But this language is concerned with how we behave on Monday morning. What we're like at home at the kitchen sink. How we get on with other people in the office. Above all, it's concerned with the most difficult love that we are ever called upon to exercise, our love for our fellow Christians, which is more difficult than love for our neighbor and certainly much more difficult than our love for the Lord. And yet by this we stand or fall. And our Lord on the last night of his life wanted us to be noticed by the world, not because we had Jesus stickers on, not because we carried a big Bible under our arm, not because we said, I don't do this and I don't do that. He wanted the badge of his disciples to be one thing, that you love one another. That you love one another. And he said it on the last night of his life because he was concerned that in his absence, those who had loved him would break up that his family would disintegrate and indeed any earthly father coming to the end of his pilgrimage would be anxious that his family would maintain a unity after he had left them that once the parent had gone that the family didn't disintegrate it is alas true that for many families the funeral is the last occasion for them getting together and from then on they go their separate ways and so Jesus on the night before he died said I have this one thing and it isn't something I'm asking of you, it's something I'm commanding you. Love one another as I have loved you. Now 1 Corinthians 13 is not only a poem, I think it's like a flower. And I've told you that you can kill a flower by dissecting it. We had to do this in college when we studied biology. We would take a most beautiful lily or something like this, an arum lily, and then we would cut it to pieces to find the pistol and the stamens and all the other bits and, and somehow the poetry was destroyed by these Latin names. I didn't like Latin anyway. I think it's the most unpoetic language. It's typically pragmatically Roman. And, and so by labeling all these things with Latin names and cutting the thing into bits, we had destroyed the beauty. And in a sense, when you take a chapter like 1 Corinthians 13 and cut it into pieces, you destroy it. But there's another way to kill a beautiful flower, and that is to rip it out of the place in which it grows, to take it from the soil, to cut it. These have been cut, and so within three days, these will be nothing to look at. And their beauty will have gone, because they've been taken out of their context. It's lovely to have them, by the way, and that's no criticism of those who lovingly beautify this place week by week and remind us of God's creativity. But nevertheless, by cutting those flowers and taking them out of the garden, they have been spoiled in some sense. Their life has been limited. And 1 Corinthians 13 is not only a flower that can be destroyed by taking it to pieces, it can be destroyed by taking it out of its garden. And the garden is chapter 12 and 14. And the tragedy is that this chapter may well be called the most misunderstood chapter in the New Testament. If I ask the average Christian, what is chapter 13 about? They will say love, and that's the wrong answer. True, the word love occurs ten times in this chapter, but that's not its subject. And as soon as you put the flower back in the garden, you see what it's about. It's not about love, not primarily. That's the secondary subject here. The primary subject is the subject of the whole flower bed, which begins chapter 12, verse 1, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. And in fact, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are all a beautiful whole, a beautiful harmony. And this flower of love is in its best setting when it's put in that flower bed. Or to use a very different metaphor, 
When we don't lick the jam out of the sandwich, but eat the whole sandwich, the bread of 12 and 14, as well as the jam, and the sweetness of chapter 13. You see, chapter 13 is written to churches full of spiritual gifts. And until we are full of spiritual gifts, chapter 13 is irrelevant. It does not apply to us until we know spiritual gifts, because it is telling us to move on to the next stage that having found the excellent way of spiritual gifts, the more excellent way is to move on from gifts to gifts plus. Not to love minus. So many who take Corinthians 13 in a context without spiritual gifts finish up with love minus and not gifts plus. They don't even know the excellent way, so they can't truly know the more excellent way. For the more excellent way is not the way of love. The next exhortation after verse 31 of chapter 12, where Paul says, I will show you the more excellent way, the next exhortation does not occur in chapter 13. Chapter 13 is a description. It is not an exhortation. There's not a single thing in chapter 13 to tell you what to do. Not one thing. So that your eye goes down the scripture to the next point at which Paul tells you what to do to find out what is the more excellent way. And the next exhortation telling us what to do is this. Follow after love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. That is the most excellent way. Not the way of love minus gifts, but the way of gifts plus love. That's the most excellent way of all. Show me a church where there are gifts of the Spirit and love, and I'll show you a church where God is moving mightily, where God is seen to be alive, where the pattern of church activity is the pattern that God intended, where there is mutual ministry within a body in which everyone is ministering to others, in which there is a mutual interdependence of individual Christians. And so in studying chapter 13 this morning, we are looking at a description, not an exhortation. We're looking at an interlude, at an aside, which is preparing us for the final exhortation of chapter 14. It's saying, don't stop at gifts, go on to something else. But if you haven't even caught up with gifts, why try and skip a vital stage and jump to the most excellent way before you've even known the excellent way? Gifts, then love, is the order of scripture here. I can't do 50 miles an hour in my car until I've done at least 30 miles an hour. And I can't know the most excellent way until I know the excellent way to which the added dimension can be given. Now there are three things said in chapter 13 about love, all in relation to gifts. There's nothing said in this chapter about love apart from gifts. That's the context. And therefore if we read the chapter through the spectacles of gifts, we shall see a totally new dimension in this chapter. We'll see what love is. Love is the quality that handles gifts correctly. It is not a thing in itself. It is that which oils the, the wheels that makes the machinery of the body of Christ run smoothly. Some of you suffer from a bit of rheumatism or rheumatoid arthritis. And you know that one of the reasons for this, one of the reasons why your body can't do things that it used to do, the mechanical parts are there. The sockets and the joints are there. What has happened? The lubrication has gone. The lubrication has gone. Therefore the joints don't move smoothly and it's more difficult for the body to operate as it should. Now what the lubrication in your bodily joints is to your body, love is to the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is made up of certain gifts which are functions within the body to make the body work. And those functions are needed. But having got the functions, it's vital that they be lubricated with love. If they are not, then nothing but pain and hurt is caused within the body of Christ. And so chapter 13 is about the lubrication of chapter 12. Chapter 13 tells you how chapter 12 can operate without there being division, without there being pain, without there being hurt, without the body of Christ being broken down rather than built up. And so love is seen to be the vital component 
necessary to the gifts. The first three verses are one section in themselves, then verses 4 to 8, and then fi- or 4 to 7, and finally 8 to 13. Just three things Paul is saying about the lubrication of the body of Christ. In the first, he is saying that gifts by themselves are going to be of little value without love. That however efficient the body may function, that however gifted its people may be, it will be of little value in the last analysis without love. And we must understand why. It is not because the gifts are of little value, but their use without love is of little value. Never belittle a gift. Every good and perfect gift comes down from heaven, from the Father of lights. Whatever gift he gives, never belittle it, never criticize it, never say it is not not worth much. If God has given something, it is a most precious thing in itself. But the use may be of little value without love. Now, Paul was a very humble man. I know he was a real choleric in temperament. I know that he could be very forceful, that he could write very angry letters. I know that some of the ladies don't feel he'd make an ideal husband. I know all that. But you misunderstand St. Paul if you don't realize that he was a very humble man. And his humility comes across in this chapter because though he's trying to correct a church, though he's aware of others' faults to a remarkable degree, nevertheless, when it comes to the deepest challenge of all, he says, there's only one person I'm going to talk to, and that's myself. If I. You never get any further in the fellowship of Christ unless each member stops looking at the others and saying, if he, if she, start saying, if I. For there's only one person for whom you are responsible to God in the last analysis. Only one person, and that is yourself. When you stand before God, he'll not ask you about Mrs. So-and-so and Mr. So-and-so. He will say, now what about you? In prayer for revival, there is only one person in the world whom you should be concerned about in a sense that revival should come to, and that's yourself. Lord, begin a revival, but begin it in me is the only valid prayer for revival. But so often we say, Lord, here am I, send him, send her. If I... Last night we saw at a table here a portrayal of the Last Supper. And Jesus said, one of you will betray me. And Peter did not say, is it John? And James didn't say, is it Thaddeus? No, what did they say? Lord, is it I? If I have all the gifts in the world but have not love, what use is that? And the gifts that he mentions are the very gifts that he's been talking about in 1 Corinthians 12, showing the continuity. Cross out the figure 13 in your Bible, if, if you don't mind marking your Bible, but cross it out. It interrupts gifts of tongues, prophecy, faith to move mountains. These are the gifts that Paul is asking. And the thing is, he had all these. He could have said, I have all these. He said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. He had that gift. He had the gift of prophecy. He had the gift of healing. He had the gift of faith. You go through his life. He had all these gifts. Yet he says, if I had, if I had, how humble the man is. If I had the gift of tongues, what a beautiful gift that is. Praise God, he's been giving it to a number of you in the very last week. Hallelujah for that. And how it released you in prayer and praise and went you bubbling over that you could praise God in in a freedom that you hadn't known before. Beautiful gift. And it may be any one of 6,000 tongues on earth, or I don't know how many there are among the angels, I'll ask them when I get there, but whether it's all the tongues of men or of angels, without love, you're just a big noise. Just a big noise. Now it's very interesting the language Paul uses, every word counts. He says you're like a gong or a cymbal. Now what does a gong or a cymbal do? Well, you heard a cymbal last night, or a gong, What do they do? Shall I tell you? They give no melody, only noise. 
They desperately need other instruments to be music. There's no music from a cymbal by itself or a gong by itself. It's just dong, dong. Can't go up, can't go down. Can't do anything but make a noise. And what Paul is saying is this, that tongues without love make a noise, but they can't convey a message. There is no meaning, there is no melody. There's no harmony. There's just noise. And in chapter 14, he's going to say what a difference love will make. Love will not only want to exercise a gift of a tongue, love will want the interpretation so that the melody may come through, so that the message may come through, so that the harmony may come through, so that the meaning may be apparent. You see, without love, you're only concerned about the noise. And while that is very edifying to yourself, it is no use to the body of itself. And so someone who shows off with that gift by itself is not loving because they're not helping anyone else, just making a noise, and that's all it is. Prophecy is a great gift. Paul is going to say later, I want you all to speak in tongues, but I want you even more to prophesy. That's an even greater gift. And that's a gift of speaking an immediate message in your own language, direct from God, for the people gathered in that place at that time to show that God is alive and, and speaks today, not just 2,000 years ago, and speaks to individuals and groups in particular circumstances and gives them a message they need to know there and then. What a lovely gift to be God's telephone, God's communication, God's mouthpiece. And you can reveal the future and reveal all kinds of things through the gift of prophecy, but without love, without love, it's very doubtful if people will accept your message. How important it is, especially if the prophecy is a rebuke, if it is a condemnation, that it be seen to come from a heart of compassion and love, because if it doesn't, the barriers go up immediately. But when you know that the person uttering a prophecy, even though it may be a condemnatory word, that that person is burning with compassion and love for those to whom the message is being given, the rebuke is received. You think through your own personal relationships. Is it not true that the only people from whom you will accept a rebuke or a criticism are those you know love you? Is that not so? From the rest you resent it or you try and excuse yourself or you try and say, well, that's their critical outlook. But when someone loves you and comes with a rebuke, what a difference. You may have all knowledge. You may have God's secrets in your own mind. You may understand things that others don't understand. You may be able to explain perfectly and know exactly every order of every event in relation to the second coming. If you did, you're the first Christian I've met who did, but you may know all God's secrets. You may have all knowledge, and you may be able to put a nice sort of timetable and map on about the tribulation, the millennium, and have it all just so. Oh, you may have all God's secrets. What's the point of having them without love? Do you notice with all these gifts, Paul says, I am nothing. He doesn't say, I do nothing, because you've done a lot. You've made a noise. You've shifted a mountain. You've done a whole lot of things. But in the last analysis, when I stand before God, God will not ask what I've done. He'll ask what you are, what I am. See, the important thing is not what you achieve, but what you become. You may have a list of achievements behind you, as long as you're armed. But the question is, in achieving all that, what have you become? What are you? And the answer is, I may have given a tongue, I may have moved a mountain, I may have had all knowledge, I may have prophesied, but after all that, I am nothing. Why am I nothing? For the very simple reason that these gifts were gifts of God, and it was God speaking, it was God acting, not me. So I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm as useless as a telephone. A telephone can be a lovely instrument when it's in the hands of someone else. And while my wife was in hospital, it's such a lovely joy to have her back here this morning. I could ring her, she could ring me, and the telephone became a beautiful instrument. But as soon as we put the receiver down, the telephone was nothing. Nothing. It was no longer used. It wasn't speaking. It was a lump of plastic and metal, which was just no use at all. In and of itself, it was of no value. Sorry to say that, I've just caught <laughs> Trevor Lawrence's eye, spends his days putting telephones in, but it is, it's absolutely nothing. <laughs> 
I'm not in, intimating that he's wasting his life, but what is, what is a telephone? But when a telephone is in the hands of someone else and being used, it becomes an instrument of love, becomes an instrument of communicating, of relating. And if I've prophesied, I've done something, yes I have, but when God stops speaking through the prophet, what is the prophet? It's as useless as a telephone that's not connected. I am nothing, but if I have love, I'm something. I'm like God. Now not only do the gifts we receive become pretty valueless to those who receive them without love, but the gifts I give become as valueless without love. Gifts, whether we receive them like tongues, prophecy, faith, knowledge, or whether we give them, if you give them without love, they, they really have limits to their value. I could give away all my money, and Paul doesn't mean to give it all away by writing one big check and in one grand gesture making myself a beggar. He, he is using a word which means to give away your money in little bits and pieces until there's none left, which requires a disciplined and careful giving to go on giving away, not just in a grand gesture, but in little bits, until there's nothing left. Surely that must be a most marvelous thing to do. I've never done that. I've met one or two who did it. And Paul says you could do that without love, because the tragedy is that giving to someone else without love becomes cold as charity. Cold as charity. One of the reasons we've had to retranslate the authorized version of 1 Corinthians 13 is that charity from being a warm, caring, compassionate word, and it was in Shakespeare's day, has become a word that is so cold and hard that we don't want it. I don't want charity. And elderly people particularly who are in need of help, if they get any sense that this is charity, say, I'd rather not have it. I'd rather struggle on, because the very word charity has become an offense. I don't want charity. Ah, but in a family, if my children have a need and I meet that need, is that charity? Never. It's love within a family. And where love is, cold charity goes. And so you can give and give and give and give without love, it's charity. And it's offensive to the one who receives, but with love it becomes sharing. One has to learn to do this. One has to learn to receive, realizing that it's not charity. When I went on my world travels about a year ago, one member of this congregation, who I'm sure doesn't get a quarter of what I get, came and offered me a little gift to help me on my way. I'm afraid I refused it. I said, no, no. That person said to me in a tone of real rebuke, you must take it because it is more blessed to give than to receive, and you must let some of us have the blessing of giving. And I realized then, it was not charity, it was love. And if it's love, then we must learn to give and receive in love. What's the biggest thing you could give? Your body. Your body. My wife and I have been very much struck with those who have said that after they are dead, their eyes can be used. To give just a little part of the eye, but to enable someone else to see what a gift. And one of the most unusual funerals I ever took was nine months after a lady had died. And there was a coffin and there were remains in the coffin. It was a strange funeral because the immediate crisis of emotion had passed and, and somehow we were free to praise the Lord even more. But why nine months after the funeral? For a very simple reason that when she died they discovered in her will that she wanted a body to go for medical research in Oxford. And they took the body away and they cut it up and they used it to train doctors to learn how to heal bodies and then nine months later what was left was put into a casket and brought back for the funeral. Very moving. But Paul is talking about doing this before you die. If I give my body 
you know that last Sunday morning we had in this pulpit Garth Hunt, who just escaped from Saigon just a few days ago, managed to bring out with him or to get out before he came out 500 Christian people whom he knew would be in danger of their lives if they stayed. So busy getting them out, he forgot to make arrangements for his own escape. But he knows and we know that in the last fortnight, men and women have given their bodies, their very lives for Christ in Vietnam. The noble army of martyrs has been swelling in this last two weeks. What a great thing to do, to give my body, to give my life, to be willing to lay down my life for someone else. I remember reading of a mother fleeing from the German army as it raced through friends after the Blitzkrieg. And she was fleeing along a road and with her child. And the Messerschmitts came machine gunning along the road. And the mother immediately threw her child into the ditch. Threw her own body on the child and took the bullets in her own body. It's a great thing to do. To give your life for someone else. Let's be careful how we use the phrase, gave your life. Many soldiers who go to war... They are not going to give their lives, they are hoping to keep them, they are hoping to be the ones to get back. But within the general picture of war there are some who quite deliberately, knowing that there is no hope to save their comrades, give their life. There is a Methodist minister who has been a great inspiration to me, who was in the army and a hand grenade was thrown among a bunch of soldiers and there it lay, right in the middle. And without a second's thought, he threw himself on top of that grenade. In a split second, he gave his body. He was not killed, in fact. But he lost limbs, he lost his sight, and he's been a wreck of a man since. But he's had a wonderful ministry. But he gave his body straight away. In a moment. Incredible instinct when every normal natural instinct would have been to run the opposite way, but he threw his body straight on it. Can you do that without love? It seems as if Paul is saying, yes, you can. And we know from church history that in times of martyrdom, there have been Christians who've been martyred for many reasons. Sometimes because they were fanatics. Sometimes because, well, alas, there is such a perversion in human nature that martyrdom even had a bit of a glamour for some. It's possible to give your body without love. What happens if you give your money or your body without love? The answer is you gain nothing. I gain nothing, says Paul. Other people would gain a great deal. They'd gain your money. They might gain their lives, but I gain nothing. For even to lay down your life without love is to gain nothing. Nothing. It's only if you love in the giving that you gain. And is it not true that if you give without love and give charity to someone, do you not hate yourself for doing it? Don't you hate the guilt complex that has made you do it? So that somebody rattles a tin in front of your face? What makes you give? Love or the guilt of walking past or the uncomfortable feeling of being put on the spot? Our motives can get so mixed up. Our, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful and, and we can... We can get in such a tangle. There's only one reason for giving and one only that's adequate and that is that you love the person in need. And then it's not charity. Let's move on to the second thing in this great chapter. It is a description of the kind of dangers that gifts have if love is not present, the kind of things that can happen in a fellowship where gifts appear and where love is absent. Now I have heard many, many tales of churches that have been split from top to bottom when the gifts of the Spirit have appeared. I've been called to many situations in which there's been division and tension over gifts of the Spirit. And they've said, we wish we'd never heard of these gifts because they've caused trouble, they've divided. And I know that that is not the truth. Gifts that are from heaven are not the direct cause of division. But I will tell you what I believe has happened in case after case after case. When gifts are given, then far more than before it is revealed whether love is present or not. And if there is no love in a church, then I would say keep gifts of the Spirit out because as soon as the gifts appear, you'll discover the lack of love. They highlight it because the gifts are the mechanical joints and sockets. And if you don't have one, then you don't miss it. But if you've got one, 
and the lubrication isn't present, then pain occurs, and you wouldn't have had that pain. Can you see? It's a, it's a bit of a difficult illustration, but then the application of the metaphor of the body to the church is always difficult. But it's a real one. And you realize that without the gifts, you would never have known that you lacked love. You see, without the gifts being exercised, personal relationships are not strained so much. There isn't the need for lubrication because you don't get so close. You're near enough to say good morning, nice to see you in church, goodbye till next Sunday. But when gifts start getting exercised, people get involved with each other very closely and the lubrication is needed. And so when gifts appear, love or lack of love appears. Again, since I mustn't use personal illustrations from family life by agreement within the family, I will say that this can happen within a family circle, that a father can give a bag of sweets to his children and can say, now share those out between you. And all was going smoothly till the gift was given. And then immediately it's seen whether there's love or lack of love. And if five minutes later the children are contented and happily sharing out equally and are sharing what has been given, and are benefiting from it, then you know there's been love. But if five minutes later you hear them argue, you've got five and I've got four, and you didn't cut that in the middle, there's lack of love. There's lack of love. Which was not revealed till the gift was given, a gift which had to be shared, and as soon as the gift demanded a sharing, then the absence or the presence of love was revealed. That's what's happening in many churches. That's why there is division. That's why there's discord. Because the gift has to be shared, and it's in the sharing that this presence or lack of love is seen. Let me tell you what will happen in a fellowship where there is no love, but where the gifts are given, and this can happen. It happened at Corinth. First, people will become impatient with each other. Love is patient and long-suffering. Literally, the Greek word is, love is slow-tempered. When did you last hear that word in English? You've heard quick-tempered, but why don't you ever hear slow-tempered? I'll tell you, because it's pretty rare. Love is slow-tempered. But as soon as gifts come, if there isn't love, then people begin to get impatient with each other. Some people receive a gift and they're like a child with a new toy and they get so excited about it. Be patient with the child. They've found something new and they're excited. Their excitement will die down and the gift will take its place. But if you'd received a present from God, wouldn't you be excited? Be patient with their excitement. Love can be patient. And those who've received gifts can get so impatient with those who haven't got them. Why won't you accept the gifts and why won't you receive what God has got for you? Love is patient and is prepared to wait. Do you know when I received my first gift of the Spirit, I think how many years God had to wait before I'd take it. And then I got impatient with other people because they wouldn't get it straight away. Love is patient, but absence of love and a fellowship becomes impatient. Not only that, people will be unkind to each other very quickly if they have gifts without love. Very soon jealousy will come in, alas, because gifts create jealousy unless there's love. You see, in a family circle where there is love, if somebody develops a special gift, say of music, within that family and begins to receive honors and begins to receive that which the rest of the family isn't receiving, does the family get all jealous? No, not if there's love in the family. You, you become proud. You're glad. The family shares the glory and the honor. And if one member is honored, all are honored. All rejoice. And where love is, there is no jealousy. But give me a fellowship without love and give one gift to one person and not to another. Jealousy will come in. Without love, people with gifts can become boastful. I have this gift. And show it off and parade it. Without love, people can become arrogant. The Greek word is blown up. Blown up. Or in simple English, get an inflated view of their own importance. Without love, people with gifts can become rude. They can insist on exercising their gift. They can interrupt someone else. They can become rude and discourteous without grace or charm. 
It says here that people with gifts but without love can very quickly become domineering and seek their own way and seek to mold the church into their idea of what it should be and seek to impose their will upon it and seek to dominate any group they're in unless it can happen without love. Without love, people with gifts become irritable and easily upset and pricked. Without love, people become resentful and keep accounts of, of wrongs done and keep memories. One of the things that love has is a very good forgettery. A very good forgettery of things that were done that hurt. Without love, people with gifts can become spiteful. They can rejoice when others go wrong. People with gifts can rejoice when those without them go wrong and say, there you are, they need the gifts. And people without gifts can rejoice when somebody with a gift goes wrong and say, there you are, that's what gifts do. And it's spite. It's spite, it's not love. And without love, people with gift, gifts can go sullen because they're not happy when gifts appear elsewhere or when they go to unexpected people. It's a pretty horrible list, this. An impatient, unkind, jealous, boastful, arrogant, rude, domineering, irritable, resentful, spiteful, sullen fellowship. Lead me to it, brother. Can you imagine it? And yet Paul is saying, that's the kind of fellowship you will have if you have gifts without love. What kind of a fellowship will you have where there is love added to the gifts? Oh, listen to this. Love bears all things. The word bears there is really covers, carries. It's where scandal occurs, where things go wrong within a fellowship. What happens? Do people gossip? No, love doesn't gossip. Love covers it. Covers it from public gaze. Protects it, bears it. Love believes all things. Or as Moffat translates that, he, love is eager to believe the best. Put the best construction on the facts the opposite of being cynical or disillusioned or suspicious. Love hopes all things, even when the worst is proved true. Love can hold on and say, I still hope. I still hope. And even when those hopes are dashed, love endures all things. What a lovely fellowship to be in. To be in a fellowship where people are going to cover me, where people are going to believe the best of me, where people are going to hope even when I let them down and where people are just going to go on enduring, we've come full circle. The first phrase in verse 4 was love is long-suffering. The last phrase of verse 7, love endures all things. There's a kind of stickability about love. I shall never forget the mother who told me that she prayed for 12 years for her son. And she said, I've seen no answer to my prayers. I don't know that I can go on. How much longer should I pray for him? And I asked just a simple question, a key question. I said, could you stop praying for your son? And she said, no. Then I knew that love was enduring. You can't stop. If you can switch off your love for someone, then it's not love. It's not love. And that's why so much of what we call love today is not love. It's not love when you can change your partners like changing your suit. That's not love. Even in a marriage we recognize it when we put a ring on a finger. We are surrounding a finger that used to be believed to have a heart nerve that went right up to the human heart from that finger. And you were surrounding it with something that has no end. A ring is something endless. You can't say where the beginning of it is. You can't say where the end of it is. You're saying love never fails. Love endures. Having loved his own, it says of Jesus, he loved them to the end. You can't love someone without loving them to the end. True love is endless, it endures. And so it holds on, it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Now which of these two fellowships do you want to be in? The one that will hurt or the one that will hold on? You have no doubt, but what you and I have got to ask ourselves, if I joined such a fellowship, would I add to the love or would I add to the lovelessness. Now we must finish with the final section of this lovely chapter. We need to see gifts in perspective. 
Oh, I wish we could get the right balance in this. On the one hand are those who so belittle gifts that they say as long as you've got love you don't need gifts, which is rubbish. And then on the other hand there are those who say that gifts are the answer to every need, that if only we had gifts we'd have the lot. Don't believe that either. There is a limit to the gifts. The place of gifts is the place of scaffolding to a new building. When this building was going up, I wish you could have seen the scaffolding needed to put that wishbone, that concrete wishbone beam in. It's a colossal beam. There's enough steel in there to build a new line for the London Underground. Just at the joint there, there are steel rods all the way down. The whole building is, is thrusting onto that one beam down to that freestanding pillar. To get that beam in place and to cast it, and if it had moved half an inch in the casting, it would have had to come down. To get that, this whole area was just packed with scaffolding and pipes and joints all over the place to hold that up so that it might be built. But when it was built, every pole of the scaffolding was taken out. It's not there now, and you never think about it, it's gone. And the gifts of the Spirit are the scaffolding to build the Church of Christ. It is not completely built yet, and the scaffolding is still needed. It's there to see that God has one day a perfect church. The gifts are, are given for edification, which means to build an edifice, to build up, to strengthen, so that the beam might stand and God may have a perfect church. And the gifts are vitally necessary, but there'll come a day when the gifts will be removed, taken out, and the church of Christ, truly built, will remain. Now when you see that, you see how valuable the gifts are and how important it is that they be used rightly. Because if that scaffolding had not been put up properly and the joints had not been properly tightened, that beam would not have been built. And if the gifts are not properly used, the church is not properly built. And there will be faults and cracks will appear. But oh how important the gifts are that it may be built. And so Paul uses a number of illustrations. For example, he uses one of every man. Now I'm a man, I've put away childish things. But childish things were important. You know, on my sixth birthday I was given a train set and I longed for an electric train set and there it was. But I have a photograph at home which shows what happened. A local bank manager always called for my father and they went to work together. They were both preachers and, and they used to have a bit of fellowship on the way to work together. And so he called, ah, train set. And he was down on the floor and he got the rails and he was fitting them together. And so my father got down and he said, well, now you put the engine on like this. And, and there they are. And, and my mother took this lovely photograph of myself standing there like this. While my father and this bank manager showed me how to use it. very kind of them, wasn't it? <laughs> and so thoughtful. And in a sense, there's something a little tragic when a man still plays with toys and hasn't grown up. But don't be little toys. Don't be little toys. When my boy was making his Meccano set, he was learning engineering. When my girl was playing with a doll, she was learning to be a mother. Oh, you don't need a train set or a Meccano set or a doll when you're grown up. You've got the real thing. But the scaffolding is gone, but it was needed. And so putting away childish things is a technical phrase meaning to put away your toys. And when a Roman boy achieved coming of age, he would gather his toys into his arms and he'd walk down the main street of the town and he would leave his toys on the altar of the church, of the temple rather, where he worshipped. And then he would put on the Roman toga, the toga virilis, the man's long toga, the equivalent of long trousers to us. And he would proudly walk back up the street with his father. He was a man now. He'd put away toys, put away childish things. And one day you'll stand in heaven and you'll say, I've put away childish things. Tongues have ceased. Prophecies ceased. Knowledge has ceased. And those who from this verse say that tongues are a thing of the past should also be consistent and say knowledge is a thing of the past too. No. When will we grow up? When will we be perfect? When the church is built. Until then the gifts are needed. But let's just see them in perspective. They will be taken away. And if all I have to show God is a gift of tongues or a gift of prophecy or a gift of knowledge, when the scaffolding goes... I go with it. There's nothing to show. Nothing to show. It's what I've built up with these gifts that's important. The second illustration is of a mirror. Corinth was famous for its mirrors of polished copper. Not far from here, 
there is a mirror, a driving mirror, attached to the bedroom window of a house. It's just on the way from Woking to Adelston. As you go over a little bridge, you see this house, and there's just a driving mirror from the window. And I know that inside that room, there is an invalid who will not leave that room. And all the invalid can see of the world is through the little mirror watches the traffic come and the children go to school and the men go to work and the house are shot through a little mirror. How frustrating that that's all you can see. And that's about all I can see of God at the moment. It's like looking in a little mirror. There's so much I want to see and I just see a tiny glimpse of God. I see a glimpse of God in, in the world he's made. I see a glimpse of God in the faces of his people. I see a glimpse of God in so many places. But it's frustrating. I can only see him indirectly. I see him reflected in what he does. But one day, I turn away from the mirror, and believe me, I won't think any, anything about the mirror then. I hope this won't shock you, but I won't even think about my Bible in heaven. It's a mirror. It's an earthly mirror. And the Bible, you won't have a Bible in heaven. You'll be looking at the real thing. And you'll be seeing face to face and you'll know God as well as he knows you. For the first time in your life, you'll be able to explain the Trinity. Because it says, I will know fully, as I am fully known, and God can explain you. And so here we are on Trinity Sunday, and we only see a little glimpse of God in the mirror of his word, and our experience, but then face to face, and we'll understand him as well as he knows me, and he knows how many hairs there are in my head, how wonderful. The third illustration he uses is the illustration of the mind. I know in part. Knowledge is doubling every, every ten years at the moment. In another quarter of a century, it'll double every five years. Three quarters of the world's scientists of history are still alive. Knowledge is just doubling so much. Earlier this morning, I was playing with a toy, in a sense, a 250-pound toy, a calculator my son has. And there it is. It isn't his. He's hoping to sell it at the town show tomorrow. There's a commercial. But there it is, the most marvelous tiny pocket calculator that will do the most incredibly complex memorizing. The most complex calculator I've seen. And yet it's just paddling in the shallows of knowledge and God had all the mathematics of the universe in his mind to start with. Oh, we're, we're penetrating God's knowledge at a remarkable speed. We're penetrating this universe at an incredible rate, but we only know in part, and everything you and I discover is something God knew already. All we're doing is catching up on him, and there's still so much to know that any scientist will tell you that we know more and more about less and less. But then I shall know as I have been known. This little brain of mine, or rather a new one in a new body, will know will know. When I have gift, when I have knowledge like that, the gifts will seem so small. We've come to the last crashing chord of this symphony of love. Listen. Faith, hope, love abides. Notice the little s I put in there because the Greek verb is singular, because he is a trinity, a human trinity now. Faith, hope, love abides. Three nouns a singular verb, that's extraordinary. You cannot ever separate faith, hope, and love. Some people have taught that faith will be swallowed up in sight and hope in fulfillment and only love will be left. That's not true. These three all abide, they all remain. They are one indivisible trinity of relationship to God. As God is a trinity, my relationship to him is a trinity. Faith, hope, and love. You can't have one without the other. Faith works by love and and faith, hope, and love just go together. You can't grow in one, really, without growing in the other two. The three belong together. And faith without love is not real faith. And faith without hope is not real faith. And hope without love is not real hope. And, and love without faith and hope is not real love. They are bound together. But having said that, even of those three, one of them is more important than the other two. One dimension of this relationship is the fundamental one. And it is love for a very simple reason. That however much faith I have, that doesn't make me like God. However much hope I have, that doesn't make me like God. But when I have love, then people can see what God is like. Because this is his very nature, this is his being. 
And on this Trinity Sunday, we rejoice that Father, Son, and Spirit are three persons in such a perfect unity and harmony that you will never hear a wrong word between them. That if you talk to one, it's like talking to the other two because they are of such one mind that you'll get the same from any one of them. And therefore, it's just... It's so difficult in a sense and experience to separate them out because they're so like each other. They're closer than triplets. The word trinity is an even closer word than triplet. And so God is a trinity and he's unity. He's three persons talking to each other. Father talks to son. Son sends spirit. Yet one. I don't understand it, but I tell you this. That when a group of Christian people are so filled with love as well as gifts, that they relate to each other and have a unity as the Father and the Son have a unity, that then people have no doubt what God is like. They have no intellectual problem with the Trinity. They can see that different persons can be one in love. So nobody says God is faith, nobody says God is hope. But one of the most profound statements ever uttered and uttered only in the context of the Christian religion, there is no other religion of the world, says this, God is love. So if you abide in love, you abide in God. Wouldn't it be a perfect finish, a real purple passage to a sermon to finish there? Isn't that the climax? No, it's not. It's the next but one climax. What is the climax? Now it comes. Oh, cross out that figure 14. I haven't got a pen. Cross it out. The climax is follow after love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. That's the climax. That's the most excellent way. For gifts without love are futile. And love without gifts is frustrated. But gifts with love, that's the more excellent way. God has been giving more and more gifts to some of you. I pray that all of you will want to receive gifts that you'll earnestly desire. It's the only coveting you're allowed as a Christian. Covet earnestly spiritual gifts. And you're not only allowed to covet them, you're, you're commanded to. Earnestly desire them. Oh, I, I beg you in the name of Christ, desire the gifts want to share them, but I beg you then, share them in love. Share them in love. Because if the gifts were not shared in love, God's work in this place could come to a standstill. His body could be broken up. The fellowship could be stricken with rheumatoid arthritis. Because the lubrication is missing. The church would be in pain and would stumble along in a world that's needing a church that's on fire, that's demonstrating the love of God. And so let's have everything that God has for us. Let's never set the gifts against the fruit. And let's realize that God wants both. But let's see the gifts as the means and the fruit as the end. The scaffolding is the gifts. The beam is the love that the gifts are to build and to hold. And to God be all the glory and the praise, the majesty and the might, and the dominion and the power, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just ask your forgiveness if we've got gifts without love. Therefore, seek to impose those gifts in a self-centered way rather than share as a family what you've given. We ask you too to forgive us if we want love without gifts, if we're a little frightened of gifts and think that love will be all we need. Lord, how could we refuse what you want to give? Father, we just confess freely now we want everything that you want to plant in our hearts. Give us gifts with love. Give us both, that your body may be built up for your glory. Through him who had all the gifts, but always 
exercise them in compassion. Even Jesus Christ, our Lord.